Yes, I have one. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, what we're trying to do is something different this year. Um, so, in the past, when it comes to both Advent and Lent, you know, there's always a, an offering container that you have in the back and you put the porks inside or whatever your heart desires. But we always wind up throwing these things out. So, we're trying to do a little more um, earth friendly going on this year. So, we have these jars. We're back at the sanctuary. All you have to do is. Open the top and fill it with money. And as I said, you know, if you want to put a check in there for 1.25 million, you're more than welcome to. It's not a problem. We will cash it. Um, and then some folks have asked, well, what do we do because they're so big they don't fit in the offering plate? Well, you'll see on the altar, there's one there now. Um, and what we'll do is on that Sunday, when you're finished filling it up, just bring it up here. So I know it's early because Lent doesn't start until the end of February, but... I just found these and I didn't want to lose them. So take them at any time you want, fill them up, bring it here. If you feel so moved, when you bring that one up here, grab another one, fill that one up, and just keep going. It's okay. But I'll put a little sticker on it. Yes. And when you're done, you, I'm sure you all get these little these stickers with your addresses on them in the mail. Just grab one of those and throw it inside. Because we're going to reuse these next year, or and at, at the end of this year, for um, Advent. So just we're gonna keep recycling these instead of making more garbage. It's good to make a loose change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect for it. You'd be 
be surprising how quickly that adds up. I left the card for the Schmelings in the back because uh, very few people had, had signed it. So please make sure before you leave that you sign the card for the Schmelings. It's a sympathy card. They lost their son, Matthew. Marianne, I'm hearing the this chair beeping. Could you check on that? Just make sure it's all the way to the top or to the bottom of the, of the staircase. Thank you. Um, just wanted to draw your attention to uh, the back of the insert of your bulletin. For those of you who remember Jerry Roba, uh, she was a longtime member of this church, but she had moved to Florida a good number of years ago, and she passed a few months back. Her niece, who's the executor of the estate, uh, I spoke with her, uh, and she, Jerry fondly remembers St. John's and all that they did for her, and that kind of thing. And so, the niece made a very nice donation to the church. But she also sent me the obituary and that, that prayer that you find on the back. It was a very special prayer to Jerry. I guess she had it handy and prayed it every day. So I thought I'd share it with you because I thought it was a beautiful prayer. So for those, um, just to give you to remember her by. And just a reminder, next Sunday, uh, next week, I'll be starting my vacation this Wednesday. And so if you have any pastoral emergencies, please see uh, Paul to Blairtown UMC for Reverend Dave Tillich, who's covering for me. And then uh, <coughs> you'll have Mark Hunts here next week. He's been here before, he's the one with the musical family, and I've gotten very good feedback from when he's been here. So you're in good hands, I trust that. Okay, uh, with that, let us stand and sing from the Red Hymnal, number 707, the Palms.
Now we move into our time where we raise before God and one another our joys, our cares, our concerns. Um, so I will begin with, uh, for those who may not have heard, Phil Tabaski, a longtime member of this church and brother in Christ, was called home to God this week. And his service will be, his funeral will be tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. at New Baker. There's a viewing from 10 to 11 prior to that. And then he will be interred in Johnsonburg. So um, prayers for the Zabowski family. Yeah, um, so Bonnie and I were talking this morning. First of all, we do have um, Vacation Bible School um, mm -hmm. coming up in August, and we're going to need help and all that kind of stuff. So we're getting ready for what God's got planned for us. But, you know, I keep thinking of what he's done for us through the generous donations coming into the church. He's got something ready for us. He's getting us ready. So all I can say is, like they used to say in Disney, this is going to be an e-ride ticket. So just sit down, strap on your seatbelt, and something is, he's got something planned for us. I just don't know what, but I just can't wait to see what it is. Amen. So that's a joy. That's a joy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I pray for, um, I'll be away. Like I said, next Sunday, uh, there are several of us in this congregation that will be at a quilt retreat, and I am hesitantly excited about it because it was canceled three days prior last week, last year. So I'm excited about it, and just pray that you know everyone goes well and is uh, just goes well. Can I pray for the snow this time? <laughs> no. We haven't had any. We've been good to you all. Doing the surgery, guys, the medical team caring for him, that all may go well and he will go through this with flying colors and just recover quickly and just return to fullness, the fullness of health. And Lord, we look forward in the year ahead to our vacation Bible school and we are gearing up 
for what you would have us do, the children you will send, and the hearts you will stir to be volunteers once again. So bless us, Lord, we pray, and use us as you will, that we may plant the seeds of the gospel in you and in these little children. And Lord, I just pray for all of us going on this retreat, that it will just be a wonderful time full of recurring um, friendships, renewing friendships, making new friends, and just that everyone may be safe and well and have a great time. And Lord, there are those worshiping with us from their kitchens and from the couches who also have cares and concerns that they face on your altar at this time. Lord, for those who have been named that need your healing touch, we ask you as our great physician to return them to fullness and wholeness of health. For those who may have been named who are grieving at this time, we ask that your spirit give them comfort and peace. And for those who have just celebrated a wonderful event in life, a joyful time, we thank you for being there, blessing it, making it all the more joyful. And as always, Lord, we pray for this world, whether it's war, let there be peace, whether there's oppression, let there be freedom. Where there's hunger, may they be fed. Where there's illness, may they be healed. Through us, through others, may this world come to know the peace of the kingdom you have promised. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your Lord, name. Your, your kingdom come, come yours will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Be yours the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 9. He wrote, Nonetheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased her joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now we'll stand and sing. This is 2219. If the title does not look familiar, don't worry. It's new for everybody. So I have asked Jim to play it through so you get to hear the tune, and then we will sing it through twice.
Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus walked, was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. July 1st through the 3rd, 1863, was a major turning point in the American Civil War, a major turning point in the direction in which our country would go in the future centuries to come. Abraham Lincoln, years later, would sum up that battle, that battle that happened in a small rural countryside in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. President Lincoln's speech started with four score and seven years ago. Our forefathers brought forth onto this continent a new nation conceived into liberty and dedicated to the pro proposition that all men were created equal. That was considered a turning point because afterwards the South never really recovered. One historian put it this way, a victory at Gettysburg could have launched at the Confederate forces into Philadelphia, Baltimore, or even Washington, D.C. Instead, Lee's army suddenly shifted from offense to defense after the defeat, and 10 days later crossed back over the Potomac into Virginia. Never again would the Confederacy regain its momentum and push deeply into Union territory, which is why many historians consider Gettysburg the high watermark of the rebellion. Turning points, major turning points, minor turning points. We all have them and have had them in our lives. When you think about and look back on your lives, Candace, maybe oh, you probably had a few in there. What sport to pick, what, what team to be on, what friends to choose. Um, most of us, when you think about back in the day and you've had to think about what do I want to do with my life? which probably led to the decision of college to go to or what vocation to, to learn, to, you know, who am I going to marry? Will we have kids? Should I get divorced? Should I go to an AA meeting? Uh, you name it. Turning points are those critical moments in life when we make decisions of which way to turn, which way to take. The Bible is full of people and hearing about their turning points, their turning point moments in their lives. And today's two readings are full of turning points. And that's why I want us to think about them. So I want to talk about the ones we hear in scripture and hopefully get you to think about the ones you have made and will make in life. We start with Jesus. And this turning point moment that we heard in Matthew, when he begins his ministry, the two sec sections before this, which you haven't heard, but um, hopefully you know. You know, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, and then he wandered 40 days in the wilderness. And then we have today's passage, where he starts his ministry. This is his baptism especially, but this is a turning point moment, because <coughs> when you think about it, what was Jesus before this? Not much special. Really, we don't hear anything about him 
between the ages of 12 to the time he's 30. That's a long time of nothing. We assume he learned to be a carpenter from his father Joseph. That was tradition of the time. He would have been a carpenter alongside his father in, in the carpentry shop. But his baptism, that was that turning point moment where he either realized or came to accept, or both, God's calling on his life. And he became a rabbi. And so he starts it in Matthew by quoting that passage from Isaiah. Now the passage in Isaiah was a turning point, was a foretelling of a turning point. It was prophesying. It was saying, a day will come, Israel, that you know, a bright light will shine. They didn't know when, but there was always out there as hope. Hope for them, freedom from oppression, hope that God would save his people. And now Jesus comes along, and he is the one who says, a light has shined. And this is a little tangent trivia that doesn't have anything to do with the topic, but I thought was great to hear. If you notice, Jesus slightly changed Isaiah's quote. In Isaiah, Isaiah wrote about Galilee of the nations. Jesus wrote, quoted, Galilee of the Gentiles. That wasn't an oops. Galilee technically was very Jewish at the time, but what Jesus was digging, making a dig there was that they had fallen so far away from following God's laws that you couldn't tell they were Jewish. That's what he was saying with that little Galilee of the Gentiles. But anyway, so here we have Jesus quoting Isaiah. That turning point had come and he was it. Then we have to look at, I can't name the twelve, but hardly even the four. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Before we apostle disciples we heard today with Jesus call. Imagine being them. They had woken up that day, just another day in life, to go and work like they've always worked, being fishermen, which is probably the only trade they knew, which assumedly was the trade of their father, and we know for um, James and John it was, because they were with Zebedee, their father, on the boat. And when you think about this, this is probably the only trade they knew. What they did for a living to sustain and put food on the table for their families and, and give them a home and a shelter and, and food to live by, this is the only thing they knew on how to survive and how to live. And yet Jesus comes along and says, follow me. And in that moment, they make that split-second decision to get up and follow a turning point can be seen or defined as a moment where we make a wise decision at a critical time in life. And that's exactly what these disciples did. Now I know I've, I've preached before about how because Jesus, a rabbi, came and called them, that was such a, a unique situation, not the usual way of doing things. That's what they just felt honored to be, to be called, and to, so they went. But they still had to make that choice. So that's what makes it such a turning point in their lives. Following Jesus should may also be a turning point in our lives. But we have so many little ones and big ones. Turning points are what make us see life differently. Jesus went on to say, you know, he continued with um, John the Baptist's word of repent. And every time, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word repent, I think, oh, oh, somebody's in trouble, somebody did something wrong, and they have to, you know, ask for forgiveness, make amends, and not do that anymore. And at times, that is exactly what repenting is about. But repenting is far more than that. It's more than just a moral acknowledgement of a wrong and, and saying, I'm sorry. It's a complete turnaround, a change, a different way of looking at life, a different way of living life. And that's what happens when we follow Christ and the way we look at things. Well, there's a lot of parents out here. Didn't life look different the day you became a parent? How many things in your house all of a sudden became killers 
to your child, you know, things that could break, things that could harm them, you know, the electrical plugs that they could poke their knife into. It, everything all of a sudden looked so different. You had to look at it through the eyes of a child and what, it, you know, what they might do with it. And you had to child-proof your house. So there's also you know, other ways. Um, bear with me with this example. It does, it does, it is appropriate, but it might sound crazy. I, what came to me as I was putting this sermon together was uh, my daughter talking about one of the gyms she used to work at. And there's a piece of equipment in most gyms that you work your inner, your outer and your inner thigh muscles. So you can imagine this is usually used by women. And in most gyms, this machine faces the wall because to use it, <clears throat> you don't look too ladylike. Let's just put it that way. In this one particular gym, though, it was facing the, the basic workout floor. Like most gyms, this gym had more men, in, far more men in it than women. And so that piece of equipment wasn't used very often, and it confused the manager. Because it's a good piece of equipment, you know, do I need to keep it? Do I need to throw it out or what? And my daughter kept going, turn it to face the wall. Women aren't comfortable using it. Ugh. He used to just brush her off. Oh, it couldn't possibly be. Something like that. Well, then one day, this manager became a dad of a beautiful baby girl. And all of a sudden, he saw this piece of equipment very differently. Maybe he envisioned in his mind taking his daughter to his gym later in life. And guess what? That piece of equipment got turned to the wall <coughs> within a couple weeks of his daughter's birth. These turning point moments change us, make us see differently, make us think differently. And our lives are full of them. The challenge is, when we make them, do we think about Jesus and picture him in the midst of it? Because following Jesus makes us walk differently, see life differently, change us. Jesus said to his disciples, I will make you, to them, fishers of men. Um, it's all, it's, he's all about changing us more into his image and more into his gospel. And if you notice, he doesn't change the fishermen very much. He still uses their skill, you know, their boats, their, their um, ability to adapt and the same area they lived in. And he does that with our lives too. No matter what we have in our past, even if we have skeletons in our closet that we don't want anybody to know about, he can use those at different moments, at turning points, if we are willing to share, if we are willing to open up and be honest, if we are willing to see the world through Christ's eyes. Just like when we become parents, we see through children's eyes. When we are willing to admit our mistakes and help someone through who's about to make the same mistake and, and get them to stop, that's a turning point moment for them where Christ has used you. Turning point moments are those moments where we see Christ eye to eye and we have to make the decision of which way to go. And they don't have to be grand. It, it doesn't have to be a baby or a marriage or a new job or anything like that. It's the little things in life. I confess I saw my cousin's name come up on the phone. You know, the, the, what do you call it? ID. And I'm like, oh, do I have time for this? Do I have time? We always talk for at least half an hour. I admit, I ignored it. I felt, oh, they could leave a message. Um, I'm feeling very guilty over that, especially after preaching this in Walnut Valley, and I'm going, I'm going to have to give this cousin a call this afternoon to see what was going on. It's those little moments where I know they need my help. Do I really have time for it? Can I do it? Turning points. What would Christ have you do? Now, don't burn yourself out. I mean, that, that's, you know, you have to take care of yourself as well, but at certain turning point moments, you get to really realize what are priorities in life. If you've had a loved one who's been put into hospice care, how many times that's the moment where everyone realizes, oh, I better visit one last time. 
I remember when my mom was in the hospital for two, the last two weeks of her life. She never got visited by her in-laws. And oh my gosh, every single one of them turned up in those two weeks. And she appreciated that. I'm not, I'm not belittling that. But I'm, I'm showing you that at certain moments, clarity comes. If you've ever gotten a, a hard to hear diagnosis, do your priorities, did your priorities change? And more about taking care of yourself and not you know, trying to please every, to take care of yourself to help hopefully get through this and live. Turning point moments teach us, stretch us, challenge us. Some of them are expected, some of them aren't, but our lives are full of that. From this day forward, be on the lookout for him. And in those moments, hear Jesus saying, come on, follow me. I have picked you. And it will either make a difference in your life or someone else's. I want to end with quoting, reading the first and last stanza of one of my favorite poems. I hope all of you know this one by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. It's another way to put this. He writes, two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. When you follow Christ, when you hear him say, I have picked you, when you make all the difference. Amen. Amen.
join me now, please, in responding in faith. Eternal, Eternal God, God, you are, are the God, God who makes extravagant promises. We relish, we relish your great promises of fidelity, and presence, presence, and solidarity, and we bask in them. Only to find out, always too late, that your promise always comes in the midst of a hard, deep call to obedience. You are the God who calls the people like us, and the long list of mothers and fathers before us, who trusted the promise enough to keep the call. So we give you thanks that you are our calling God, who calls always to dangerous new places. We pray enough of your grace and mercy among us, that we may be among those who believe your promises enough to respond to your call. We pray in the one who embodied your promise and enacted your call, even Jesus. Amen. Now, Mary, could I ask you to bring the offering forward? Great God of heaven and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our presence. May this act of giving be a gesture of your willingness to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 152 in the red hymn.